Hello, and welcome back to AOPA's Pilot Information Center live stream webinar series. Thanks for joining us. Our topic for this episode is the FAA medical application process with a focus on first-time applicants. I'm Ferdy Mack. Thanks for joining us. This webinar is brought to you by AOPA's Pilot Information Center. If you are new to our webinars, please subscribe to this channel with the subscribe button. Also, send us your questions during this live presentation through the chat box. We will answer the most popular questions at the end of this hour-long presentation. And if you're not watching this live, please feel free to contact us with your questions directly here in our Pilot Information Center at 800-872-2672 or email pilotassist at aopa.org. And we'll provide that contact info again at the end of the presentation. Before we get started with our content, I wanted to mention that it's uh, March coming into April now in 2019, and our AOPA flight scholarships are about to close for entries. We've got over $1 million in money that we're looking to award to, uh, to deserving prospective pilots and, uh, and other types of pilots as well, maybe for future training, uh, for uh, you know, add-on training, uh, and also uh, to educators. So check out aopa.org slash scholarships and get your application in. The deadline is at the end of Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019, just in a few days from now. So joining me this evening is Gary Crump, our Director of Medical Certification in our Pilot Information Center. Thanks for being here, Gary. Thanks, Ferdy. Good to be back. <laughs> Glad. Always. Here we go again. Uh, here we go again. One more time. Uh, and just for background, Gary, <laughs> remind me, how many years have you been doing this? Uh, 32. Coming up on 32 years. And that's 32 years focusing on Airman Medical Certification. Other than the first six months that I was here, I was uh, actually in uh, the Aviation Technical Specialist position. Right back when our 800 line was still just a few years old. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, transitioned into medical six months after that, mm -hmm. and I've been here ever since. Fantastic, it's, it's been a long journey, I know, and, and you know, what I always love about bringing you on camera, uh, and on podcasts as well, if you haven't checked those out, is, uh, we're, you know, it's not just the material that we learn and become familiar with and are able to help our members with, but it's the experience. And especially yeah. with FAA Aeromedical, uh, some things are in print, some things aren't. And it's just by understanding yeah. each individual's situation that we're able to, to best guide them, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Experience does count a lot. And here at AOPA, we're fortunate to have a lot of people in the staff that have been here a long time. And, and, and you cannot, you can't substitute for the experience that, that all those people that have uh, been here a long time have brought to the table. And it's no exception, no different in medical certification. We have a great, great talented staff in the PIC medical certification area too because the regulations are pretty straightforward. You can read about it in 15 mm -hmm. minutes, the, the Part 67 standards, but it's all the policy and procedures that goes on behind the scenes that that makes work for us and helps us help you understand what's really going on and how the certification process works. Right. And if you haven't reached out to us before, <coughs> you really should, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it gets AOPA is the only organization in aviation that has a dedicated medical certification staff. That's what we do, and uh, you know, we stay pretty busy at it, but we know probably as much about what goes on outside the FAA as anybody does, and I'm, I'm, uh, I guess I'm a little biased in, in that opinion, but you know, it, it ain't lying if, it's, if it ain't true. So, it's, <laughs> right. you know, yeah, so yeah, we got a great, great group of people, and uh, we live to serve members, so that's that's what we're here for. So you know, and I'll say it numerous times throughout the course of the evening. Here is call us if you have questions because it's a lot easier for us and for you as a pilot to deal with an FAA issue before it becomes an issue. Right. And that way you get everything into the FAA and make them happy, and then you get a medical and you're happy, and then everybody's happy. Right. Right. So contact us first. Contact us often. We can help you with that. Absolutely. So uh, <coughs> the motivation here for tonight's show was. You know, Gary and I have gotten in the studio, both in front of the cameras and in the podcast studio uh, a couple times a year for many years now, talking about medical certification. In particular, the past few years, we've had a fairly serious focus on basic med, since that's uh, new and hot, uh, and we're, uh, we're past 45,000 uh, pilots, 46,000 pilots on basic med now. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. Instead, we wanted to start with the, the philosophy of uh, a scratch pilot or a uh, student pilot who has five or 10 or 20 hours. And hopefully by now, if they're at that point, their instructor has started to encourage them, hey, you need to start thinking about getting a medical certificate. So the whole purpose of this presentation is instead of tripping over and mentioning, oh, by the way, if this is your first time, you might want to know this, 
we designed this presentation to be solely targeted towards the idea of, so you need to get a medical certificate. The whole thing is new, foreign, and perhaps completely unknown to you. Maybe you haven't even started flight training yet, or maybe you haven't had any discussion with your instructor yet. So we wanted to bring you what we think you should know based on our experience mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, you know, what's involved in applying for the medical certificate, uh, what's involved with the actual exam, and then at the end, we'll talk about now what? What do we, how do we continue with medical certification? And you, you raise a good point because really the most important thing that we, in our world in medical certification that I think a lot of CFIs are somewhat deficient in is they don't really push the need for getting the medical certificate done early on in flight training. Soon enough. Yeah, for sure, because you're gonna blast through the first 10 or 20 hours and you're gonna be ready to solo. And if you don't have a medical certificate, you're not gonna be able to do that. It's no problem if you get issued a medical certificate at the time you go in for your flight physical, but that doesn't always happen and sometimes you have to get deferred and that's a word we'll talk about numerous times tonight. It's, it's, it, it's, not, a wor it's not something you want to have happen. Deferrals mean a delay, mm -hmm. uh, the big D. So uh, we encourage the CFIs to really push getting the medical certificate on the front end of training before they really get a student involved in it and then get them ready for solo and then they, they can't solo for three right. months because their medical's tied up and they've lost, you know, you lost some training time, you lost some money and you lost uh, the edge of uh, the edge of the training. So get that medical certificate issue out of the way first and, uh, and then go out and enjoy solo and <laughs> everything that comes after that. Right, right. So let's jump in by talking about uh, motivation. What is your motivation for flying and how does that plug into medical certification? Yeah, it's really, you know, when we put this slide together, I had to kind of think about this too because it's been a long time since I was a student pilot. And um, yeah, for me, it was just, you know, I, I took my first ride in a, in a VTEL Bonanza uh, many, many years ago. I was like 15 and I knew right then, oh, this is something I want to do. Mm -hmm. But when you, we, we, looking at the slide there, we say, what is the motivation? Is it curiosity, passion, a dream, or you want to fly professionally? I think for a lot of people, it's probably all of those things. Maybe not so much <laughs> a financial gain, but certainly there's a curiosity there. And I think some people just have an inbred, it's in their DNA that they want to go fly an airplane. That's an expression yeah. I use around our department all the time. You yeah. can tell if it's in, so in your blood or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, even though you don't have to de decide your, you know, your ultimate career goal when you're a student pilot, you need to think about it a little bit because what you want to do with a pilot certificate has some bearing on what class of medical certificate you're going to need. And uh, so let's just launch right into that because uh, in the, the FAA's world, there are actually three classes of medical certificates. And we'll start with the first class, which is the highest class of medical, and then we'll work in reverse order because uh, you, you start at the bottom and work your way up. But a first class medical is the, the highest level, the highest scrutiny mm -hmm. of medical certification, and it's, it's required for the pilots who exercise airline transport pilot certificate. Uh, that means they're sitting in the left seat of the airlines that you fly from uh, Dallas to Boston in. So uh, those are required for airline pilots, but there's a little catch, and here we are talking about catches in this thing, and we're gonna be talking about a lot of those. If you're interested in getting into a degree program through a university flight program uh, called a 141 school that have very structured curriculum, and a lot of times it's associated with, uh, with a degree program, a lot of those schools <laughs> require that even a zero-time student pilot mm -hmm. come in with a first-class medical. Which, to point out, is probably not required, or I wouldn't go so far as to say inappropriate, although some might argue, it's not required for the type of piloting that's going on. It's an arbitrarily higher notion of a requirement right. based on the flight school's preferences? It, it's that, and I think they're, they're trying to give the benefit of the doubt because before you go out right. and invest $100,000 plus to get a four-year degree and all the certificates and ratings you need to fly professionally, right. the, the universities just want to make sure that you can at least qualify for a first-class medical. Right. I personally have an issue with that because just because you can get a first-class medical at age 19 at age 23 or 25 or whenever you've got enough time to actually go out and start applying for the airlines, right. that doesn't necessarily mean you'd still be able to qualify for medical because a lot can happen medically from the time you're young until you're a little bit older. But I understand the philosophy behind it and it's, it's just one of the realities. So right. uh, 
Ordinarily, our rule of thumb is don't apply for any higher class of medical than what you really need for the privileges that you're going to exercise. Right. But there's nothing, uh, nothing really wrong with getting the first class, but um, most people are going to get either a second or a, a second or third class when they're brand new starting, starting out. Second class medical is required for everybody else that wants to fly commercially uh, for hire. Um, first officers on the scheduled airlines, mm -hmm. they need a first class to get hired, and after that they can get by with a second class. But any other commercial activity, activities, uh, banner towing, uh, flying skydivers, aerial application, crop dusting, anything else that you're getting paid for would require a minimum of a second class medical certificate. But for the majority of our audience tonight probably, a third class is all you're going to need to start with. And uh, we'll talk about the durations of those medicals here a bit later on. But for a student pilot and uh, for private pilots, if you've been out of flying for a long time or coming back into it, third class is all you need. And uh, it's, I won't say it's the easier class of medical, but the standards are a little bit more flexible and a little bit more forgiving for a third class medical than they would be for a first or second class. Right, and for example, we'll, we'll get into it later, but uh, you say uh, the standards are a little different. For example, third class has a lower vision requirement. Correct. Uh, the, the key differentiator I want to make sure people come away with regarding the different classes of medical is first and second class medicals, as Gary said, are for commercial activities, commercial pilots performing commercial activities. What we're really talking about there is you're getting paid, okay? For compensation or higher, you're going to need some manner of second or first class medical. The third class medical, on the other hand, the, the strict differentiator would be you're not receiving compensation uh, or in, and you're not operating for hire. Correct. As a private pilot, uh, which is what the, the type of pilot certificate would be that right. goes along with that, uh, there are exceptions such as flight instructors uh, can hold a, thir a third class medical and operate and get paid. Uh, that is an explicit exception, but in general, the key differentiator is at the end of the day, did you receive benefit, pay, uh, or other incidentals. Uh, right. And, yeah. and in addition to that, for somebody who wants to advance their certificates and ratings but not <laughs> necessarily exercise those privileges, right. a pilot can uh, go out and take an ATP check ride mm -hmm. and be granted an ATP certificate on a third class medical because you're not exercising those privileges. Right. So that's something not everybody understands. Even a lot of flight instructors will call us and you know don't have clarity on that as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but. Uh, Third class is what we're going to be focusing on, and then we uh, also got on that slide there, talked a little bit about, about basic med. We're not. This isn't a basic med talk. Believe me, we've talked a lot about basic med for the last two years, so we'll touch on that. Yep. But um, in order to play with basic med, you got to have a third class medical at least one time anyway. So for if you're out there in the audience and you've never held a medical certificate before, third class is really what you want to start out with, and that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, tonight. Right. Right. Okay, so uh, it's time to apply. How do I get started in, in the application process? The application now is on is an online process for many, many, many years. It was a paper form that you would fill out when you show up in the Aviation Medical Examiner's Office. AMEs are <coughs> physicians who are designated by the FAA through training, recurrent training, to administer and issue medical certificates. So in order to do that, you got to go on to the FAA website www. It seems like you can't just punch in FAA. You got to go www.faa.gov. Or here's the links here on the slide. Now it's called MedExpress. It is an online form. You'll have to create an account. FAA loves to uh, have you fill it and make a, accounts for just about everything that you do in your uh, FAA experience. And so everything is done online now using uh, a, a, an account. So you'll create that account using an email address and creating a, a specific password to satisfy the FAA's privacy requirements mm -hmm. and then uh, you'll go through the application and we're gonna we're gonna focus on the application here in just a little bit and kind of walk you through some of the the gotchas that are potential on uh, on a legal form which is what the FAA medical application is so once you get logged in and uh, get get into the system then you start going through the form and we'll uh, we'll let's hit on let's hit take on a the look form at what here. that looks like yep, yeah. let's take a look here first thing you're gonna see is a, a general uh, question or two. One of them is going to be what What are you applying for? Now this form has not been updated because you only have one choice here for item number one. It's an Airman Medical Certificate. So that's a, that's an easy one. You'll pass that part of the, qu the quiz real easily. 100%. Second one is uh, 
again, the class of medical. One, one thing, just a little anecdotal piece here. The FAA is the only country in the world that I'm aware of that has three classes of medical certificates. Everybody else in, in the world has two. So their first class everywhere else is for airline pilots mm -hmm. and professional commercial pilots. And the class two is equivalent to our third class medical. But we did it differently and we actually have three classes of medical. So you have three options there on the MedExpress application. So again, we say apply for the lowest class of medical you need. So in this case, click button number three and uh, that'll get you on the road to looking for the, for the third class medical application. Okay. Moving on then, type of pilot certificate you hold. Now if you have already, if you've been in the system before and you've got at least a student pilot certificate, you're going to check student. But if you've never applied for a medical and you have never held any type of an airman certificate before, just check none and that'll, that'll get you through that, uh, that part of the application as well. And then the uh, next item underneath that is check no prior application. So if this is your first time ever, you know, check that. And that way the FAA is not going to go to a lot of trouble trying to find you in the system because you're not going to be there. You're going to be getting into the FAA medical system for the first time with this application. Right, right. Okay. Uh, should I be a little particular in making sure I enter everything correctly? Yeah. <laughs> I think so, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, um, I only found this out about a year and a half ago, and I've been doing this for 32 years, and I'm, you know, the learning never stops. That's probably one thing that we, you'll hear pilots say all the time, the learning never does stop, and it's certainly in our, in our field of it, too. The FAA considers any application, in this case for a medical certificate, to be a form of an investigation. Mm -hmm. And it's not <laughs> like it's a criminal investigation, but it's a civil investigation. So when you make an application, you're, uh, you're actually completing a legal document. And mm -hmm. uh, when you sign electronically at the completion of the application process, you're giving the FAA authority to do some certain things. But it also is holding you to a standard to attest that all the information you provided on that application is is true and honest to the best of your ability. So, you know, don't be intimidated by the application, but uh, just recognize that uh, you want to be as truthful as you as you possibly can. That doesn't mean that sometimes there will be honest oversights and you you, you forget a surgery that you that you've had before that you'll then there's a question on that that we'll talk about here in a minute. So inadvertent oversights are not going to get the level of scrutiny. The FA may come back and ask you questions about it, but it's the intentional, willful, fraudulent mm -hmm. misrepresentation of, of, of facts on a medical application that, that uh, will get you in, in involved with FAA legal uh, pretty fast. And you know nobody wants to get involved with FAA legal, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so uh, we've got three major types of data that we need to provide, r besides our demographics, like who we are and what we do and what our DOB height, weight, and right. eye color are. Uh, as far as our medical background, shall we say. So the first is medications. The let's, three, let's yeah, the three areas that. are the ones that, that we get the most questions about because these are, the, these are the important ones. There's a section on medications and your CFIs, if you're a brand new student, you're gonna hear the CFIs often say, read the question, especially when you get around to take your written exam. Yeah. You know, that's sort of paraphrasing what they really say, but we can't say that on camera. So read the question carefully, particularly the question regarding medications, because the question is asking if you are currently using any medications. And I wish I had a dollar for every member that has called in over the years who called in and who called us and told us that they had reported a medication on the application that they haven't taken for years. So they're only asking about medications that you're currently taking. So uh, read the question carefully. Now we'll talk about medications here a little bit more, but we'll just hit on a couple of things right now. Um, actually, the FAA is pretty generous in what medications they allow pilots to fly with. Mm -hmm. Some of those medications have certain limitations, time restrictions. They don't want you to fly within you know, 24 hours or eight hours or six hours, depending upon the medication, because of the potential for side effects that can present themselves when you get up in uh, at even the relatively modest general aviation altitudes, and we'll talk about that a little bit further. But, but there are definitely medications that are not allowed by the FAA. In uh, 2001, we started developing a database mm -hmm. of uh, medications that uh, we've built to this day, and it has over you know, probably 1,200 medications in it right now that are both allowed and those ones that are not allowed by the FAA. 
So uh, that's one of the resources you have as an AOPA member is going into the medications database or give us a call and uh, if you can't find the medication that you're talking about. So we'll, we'll be talking about medications throughout the course of, uh, of the hour here on, in, uh, on different scenarios. But the key thing is don't, talk, don't report anything that you don't have to. And any medications that you're no longer taking, no longer using on a regular basis, do not have to be reported on the application itself. Right, and I think people get uptight, but <coughs> uh, it, with good intent, when they go to answer that section on uh, reporting medications, both prescription and non-prescription on their application, <coughs> over over reporting. Uh, for example, if uh, if they had a root canal six months ago, and mm -hmm. they received three days of pain medicine prescribed by the by the oral surgeon, sure. Uh, six months later, they're filling out their medical application. They might say, "Oh, do I have to list that medication?" And sometimes er they think they're erring on the side of caution. By doing so, when we need to focus back on the language that's on the application, no yeah. different than answering the question that is asked, namely, do you currently use that's it. any medication? It, you may have a prescription for a medication that's been in your medicine cabinet for six months, but mm -hmm. if you're not taking it anymore, the FA doesn't need to know about that, and they don't want to know about that um, because the next <coughs> section, the medical history section, is where we'll pick up on that. But uh, right. don't want to run that into the ground, but medications are an important an <coughs> important part of the application mm -hmm. process. And a lot of pilots get initially denied mm -hmm. because they <coughs> report a medication that they're no longer taking and then they have to go through the motions of getting a letter from their physician and explaining why they were on the meds in the first place and when they were discontinued and how you're doing after the fact. So it's, uh, again, one of those things that once you start down that rabbit hole, the FAA is going to explore it until they're satisfied that it's not an right. aeromedical problem. And we're not advocating that you, you li uh, lie by omission. Not at all. That you, uh, you don't list these things, these medications. We're just emphasizing you need to answer the question properly and accurately. Right. But right. you need to understand what they're after. Yeah. Uh, now, now, conversely, you know, the application isn't worded in a way that they're looking uh they're leaving you an out or loophole where, oh, I'm on a disallowed medication, and by the way, it's for a condition that the FAA wouldn't like either. I'll just right. not take that medication on the day I fill out my medical exam. Yeah. Technically, strictly speaking, that would be along with the letter of the way the question is worded. Do you currently use any medication in some sense? But fundamentally, uh, from a principled perspective, that's not Yeah, correct. that's a little bit too generous an interpretation right, exactly. that the FAA doesn't really exactly. abide by too well. So Exactly. And it doesn't yeah. say, do you take any medication today? It says right. currently. Currently. So, so you have to define currently in your right. own mind and, again, you know, answer to the best of your ability. Right. So let's talk about some of the medications that aren't allowed by the FAA. That's not to say that there aren't lots of them that are, but these are some of the ones that we deal with on a regular basis that the FAA has problems with. So uh, <coughs> certain heart medications, actually the FAA allows the vast majority of cardiac drugs, whether they're antiarrhythmic drugs or um, uh, drugs to improve your pump function of your heart, but mm -hmm. the drugs that they don't allow are those drugs that are called vasodilators that uh, are used to basically treat angina, which is chest pain that's associated with heart disease. And heart disease is one of the disqualifying conditions, and we'll talk about those later. But those drugs are called vasodilators, and uh, a lot of them are nitroglycerin-based that actually dilate the coronary arteries so that there's more blood flowing through, and it reduces the symptoms of angina. But the FAA doesn't like to see you having to take a medication and relying on that medication to keep you pain-free mm -hmm. because you're still at risk for having a, uh, having a problem. Um, just by virtue of the fact that you got a cardiac problem that requires that medication. I do want to make one comment though. You mentioned uh, uh, cardiac conditions that are disqualifying. When we use that word, what I want you to really hear is initially disqualifying. Correct. We're going to talk about right. 15 conditions a little later in the slide deck, but I don't want you to be scared off. There are conditions that <clears throat> if you have, uh, when you initially apply for a medical certificate, the FAA is going to say, mm, we don't feel that you qualify uh, to be healthy enough to, to meet the criteria for, to hold a third class medical certificate at this time based on what you've given us. All right. But for some, many of those conditions, uh, you can apply for a special issuance, which is basically a way that FAA Medical can take a, a re-examination of your file. You may have to uh, provide additional information. Right. Uh, and then you would be able to get certified uh, under a special issuance for that same class of medical certificate. So when we talk about disqualifying, what we really mean is initially disqualifying. And you kind of swerved into one of the <laughs> one of the things we want to touch on is the FAA's 
certification philosophy mm -hmm. because really, contrary to a lot of pilots' opinions, the FAA is not out to ground pilots. And mm -hmm. it's quite the opposite, actually. The FAA, from an aeromedical standpoint, is always trying to find a way to get a yes to get as many pilots flying in the system as they possibly can. The issue is that for uh, for a lot of people with medical conditions that are really serious medical conditions or they have multiple conditions, the pathway to getting to yes requires a lot of documentation, a lot of testing, a lot of time, uh, a lot of persistence, patience, uh, frustration along the way. Obviously, it's worth it when the medical certificate finally gets issued, but the FAA's job is to maintain the safety of the airspace, and that's their mandate, and they, they take it really seriously. So they make you jump through a lot of hoops for a lot of these conditions, but you know, their ultimate goal is keep the airspace safe, and yet, at the same time, get as many pilots flying as they possibly can. Right, exactly. Yeah. So let's go back to these disqualifying medications, and we'll just touch on those again. Cancer treatments, uh, we talked to a lot, of, a lot of pilots with all kinds of different cancers. The chemotherapy, uh, the chemotherapy drugs, uh, some of the newer biologics that are coming out on the marketplace now, and radiation therapy, those are the most common forms of cancer treatment that we see. And uh, if you watch you know, primetime television every night, you're seeing so many new med medications that are being in our face. Uh, the FDA, uh, FDA is really working overtime to get a lot of drugs to market. The FAA's policy on medications, and we'll just touch on that right now, is that when a new drug comes on market uh, by the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, the FAA isn't just, just going to automatically allow that medication for aviation duties. They're going to observe the, the, the medication usage in the general population for one year, and then after a year, um, they'll take a look <laughs> at the medication and if it's uh, if, the, if it's a medication that they're seeing a lot of people applying for mm -hmm. or asking questions about they'll run it by their their internal review board their therapeutics and pharmaceuticals committee at FAA headquarters and they do a, a tremendous amount of research on all the available literature they look and see the risk profile the risk assessment uh, the uh, the complications associated with the medication usage that's been observed since the FDA approved it so they'll, they'll make that determination, but only after they've really studied the drug for a long time. So that's one of the, one of the mechanisms they have in place to, to maintain that safety mandate. Mm -hmm. Controlled substances, uh, boy, that's, we're getting a lot of calls about this too. Uh, all the scheduled medications, schedule one through five medications, that includes certainly all the <laughs> illegal drugs, but uh, unfortunately that includes marijuana. Uh, any the THC derivative medications and we're now we're getting a lot of comments and questions about CBD cannabidiol now the, the the oils that are derived from hemp which is the same substance that cannabis sativa comes from but the CBD oils just don't contain the psychoactive drug mm -hmm. tetrahydrocannabinol however because these uh, CBD uh, substances are not regulated by the FDA there's no quality control and the FAA is concerned about that because they don't know for sure that the CBD that you're buying uh, <laughs> online may not have a trace of THC in it. So, you know, that, so they're saying or stay may, away from may it. May have. May have, yeah, right. exactly. It's like buying decaf when it's really not decaf. Right. Yeah. And we just got this clarification a couple of weeks ago from the FAA, so, and we expected the answer that we got, but they're mm -hmm. saying, you know, <coughs> no, we're not going to. We're not going to let pilots fly when they're, if they're using CBD. And the, unfortunately, the, the CBD is, is, I mean, there's a lot of literature on that now. And it's, um, the, the therapeutic benefits are really quite, quite amazing for arthritis, uh, some GI conditions, back pain, you know, body, you know, and, and it's wide application. So right. somewhere down the road, maybe they'll get a little bit more flexible, but uh, this is the FAA and they tend to be pretty conservative, so. And, and just to clarify on the, on the marijuana issue, since it seems to, ex expand every year. Uh, it, the problem is the disconnect between the federal government and the states that are Correct. allowing it. Correct. Uh, the FAA is a federal agency, so federal law uh, trumps. So if the feds say it's illegal, it's illegal. And, and by extension, the FAA then says, not only is it illegal, but obviously we don't want you on it. Uh, despite any any potential you know therapeutic and beneficial yeah. uh, medical applications, yeah, yeah, and, and and we're seeing more and more states that are decriminalizing it, legalizing it, mm -hmm. both recreationally and for for medical use. But 
as long as it's still in the federal statutes as a prohibited substance, a scheduled drug. Right. No, no way, no way, Jose. So right. just just be aware of that because um, you know, it's a, there's a lot of a lot of curiosity, a lot of a lot of inquiries about it. So. Sure. Uh, some of the diabetes medications, again, the FAA is really generous in the diabetes medications because diabetes is really an epidemic in this country. So there are lots and lots of pilots who are certified under a special issuance uh, with uh, both oral medication controlled diabetes and insulin controlled as well. Mm -hmm. There's one, one group of diabe diabetic drugs called sodium glucose cotransporter inhibitors. They're really very, very good medications for diabetics but their mechanism of action uh, gives the FAA some pause about the, the safety concerns. Uh, drugs called Invacana, Farsiga, and Jardiance, those are the trade names. Um, in the course, in the process of reducing blood glucose, they also deplete sodium. And sodium is one of the key electrolytes in our bodies. And when, we, we, when the sodium goes low, then we have the potential for having some adverse side effects that could yeah. be in, in result in impairment or incapacitation. Like so changing the pH across those neuron <coughs> gaps, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's a recipe for body shutdown. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So um, those are great drugs, but you just can't fly on them. Then the psychiatric medications, that probably goes without saying, but uh, the psychiatric drugs that are used to treat uh, schizophrenic disorder, bipolar, <coughs> um, the antipsychotic medications, some, most of the antidepressants, you see an asterisk there on the antidepressants because the FAA does have a policy in place that was uh, formulated and put into effect in 2013 that allows a special issuance, which is a discretionary issuance, mm -hmm. Verdi, you, know, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, allows for four of the SSRI antidepressants that uh, will allow you to get a special issuance. The process is expensive, it's time consuming, it's kind of frustrating because it just takes so long, but uh, it, there's a mechanism there. Again, the FAA is giving you an opportunity to mm -hmm. get to yes, mm -hmm. it's just the, the, the road to getting a special issuance on one of the SSRIs requires a comprehensive evaluation through a specially trained uh, AME. You have to be under a psychiat psychiatrist's care, you have to be on the medications for at least six months. You can only take one of the four SSRIs. We got all the details, so if you have questions about that, give us a call. And Andrew's actually asked us that question, can you walk us through the process and timing? I think you've done a good job there. And, and let me check my memory. Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro, and Prozac. You got it. Those yep. are the four. Those are the four, yeah. right, right. And they're very common um, SSRIs, and they are, you know, they, the FAA specifically chose those four when they put this policy together because they have uh, a, a mild, relatively mild side effect profile, mm -hmm. and they have a, a, a very good efficacy. That is, they work in, uh, in treating depression. So um, all the, the mental health issues, the FAA is super sensitive to uh, on the basis of uh, you know fairly recent history of accidents involving um, um, some psychiatric diagnoses. So they, they look at the, the mental health issues real closely now. So um, you'll be under extra scrutiny if you have a psychiatric history, especially if you uh, are on one of the allowed uh, SSRIs. So let's look at uh, some of the policies and some of the guidelines that the FAA has for any other medications that, that they allow um, with certain types of limitations. The, the rule of thumb with medications usage uh, for just about anything, whether it's an over-the-counter med or, or even a prescription medication, is weight five times your dosing interval after your, your last dose before flying. Now this doesn't necessarily apply in every circumstance. Mm -hmm. If you're taking a daily aspirin <coughs> just because your doctor says it's a good idea, don't worry about that. But uh, medications affect everybody a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And you know, even though the, the baseline when you're on the ground is one thing, but when you get to altitude, even five, six, seven, eight thousand feet, those medications can have a different effect because of the way the blood gases change mm -hmm. and the, the concentrations of the medications in the blood and your level of hydration or dehydration. So wait five times the dosing interval after your last dose and then it's considered that the, the effects of the medication are going to be out of your system and you're going to be uh, on the safe side to fly. And, and just to give a literal example, so dosing interval, if I've got a labeled uh, you know, prescription bottle in my medicine chest and it says take every four hours. That's your dosing interval. Correct. Four times five is 20. I'd want to wait a minimum of 20 hours. Correct. Rough guideline, 
That's right. It, because everybody's different. There's right. no way you can really put together a, 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 a rule that says this applies to everybody. Right. right. Nothing, nothing, nothing is that cut and, cut and dried as much as we'd like for right. it to be. And as you can see on the rest of the slide <coughs> there, uh, we've got some very long wait times depending on the types of, uh, of medications we're talking about as well. Uh, not only uh, 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 dipen diphenhydramine, which yeah, Benadryl, diphenhydramine, that is one of the most commonly found medications, unfortunately, in the post-mortem toxicology studies that are done by the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute and uh, uh, the victims of aircraft accidents. So mm -hmm. they find diphenhydramine there a lot. And I tell you, you go to the pharmacy and get, look at eye level for the over-the-counter, you know, prescription or non-prescription treatments for for colds and coughs and upper respiratory infections, and you'll you'll find diphenhydramine as an ingredient in probably most of them. There's a couple examples there: Tylenol and Motrin and Robitussin, and then the brand name Benadryl. Uh, they're, they're, it's a it's a great medication. It's an allowed medication. You can fly with it, but you notice there's a 60-hour wait time yeah. after using it because the the half-life is so long in that medication, and the 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 the, the list of side effects is really pretty. Pretty long too. Drowsiness yeah. and somnolence and and cognitive disorders and vision problems and headaches and all kinds of things. So uh, that's that's one of the real bad boy drugs out there that's allowed, but you know take it with with great caution. Yeah, for two, sure. two and a half days is a long time. And yeah. I, and uh, as Nyquil, I think, is in that. that yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because th those those drugs are marketed to help you sleep, and the ingredient that helps you sleep is diphenhydramine. Right. So it's, uh, you know, it's it, it works great, but right. uh, it's 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 one that you want to be careful with. So and, and actually, I think uh, many many people who don't pay that much attention to the names of medications aren't aware that <clears throat> if you take Tylenol and add Benadryl, you've just created Tylenol PM. So yeah. if you reverse that equation, what I'm telling you is that Benadryl is the thing that changes Tylenol PM uh, changes Tylenol into Tylenol PM that Correct. makes it the sleepy version. Correct. It's Benadryl. Yeah, pharmaceutical marketing. It's yeah. great. They're, they're brilliant. <laughs> so, other, conversely, if you need to, if you need a little help sleeping, and you don't want to take acetaminophen, you could just take Benadryl. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. You know. Or if you have trouble sleeping, melatonin, yes. which is a natural substance and it's perfectly safe and it's allowed and it works really well. I, I take melatonin on a regular basis, so it's uh, it's that's a good alternative to any of the sleep medications. So we pretty much kill the medications a little bit, but it's an er it's an important area. We we answer a lot of questions about medications because so many people are taking all kinds of different things for all kinds of different reasons. So be aware uh, uh, that the medications you're on may be may be a problem. If you're not sure, give us a call. Uh, the one thing we didn't hit uh, in medications is off-label use. We usually end up going there, and this yeah. one we didn't. Yeah, yeah. And and the way to look at off-label use is. Number one, FAA doesn't care if you're using a medication for a different purpose or a different, right. uh, different uh, condition. They care about, the s number one, the side effects of the medication on you as an airman. And they also think, well, if you're taking, uh, let's say, gab gabapentin for uh, restless leg syndrome. Right. Well, right. gabapentin's on-label use is to prevent seizures. And so then FAA right. thinks, do you have a problem with seizures? Right. So it, it's a it's a myriad of problems with off-label use. Your doctor may be thinking they're doing you a favor. Yet another reason why you'll want to contact us first, so you, we can discuss that. Because one of the great benefits we can do as your advocate is try to help you establish a plan with your treating physician to get you onto on-label applications or medications, or maybe even suggest ones that you could try coming off if you've been on for 20 years and no longer even know why or if you should still be on them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you've actually swerved into a, a, a good point there because when we're talking about medications usage, the FAA always looks at it as part of a, a two-sided coin or a two-edged sword because <laughs> The medication is one issue because of the potential side effects, but the other issue that's equally important is why are you taking that medication in the first place? Uh, and you that's see, you see what I did there. Yeah, I was leading yeah, us into the. You did. You, yeah, you segued us beautifully into that. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, in that example, gabapentin is an anti-seizure medication. Um, it's it's beneficial for people with restless leg syndrome, just as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not allowed. It's not allowed, right? Regardless of why you're taking it, and that's one of the that's one of those anti-seizure medications that are just absolutely prohibited. So, because of the risk, because of the reason, the underlying medical reason that you're taking the medication in the first place. So, right. you know, good good point on that. 
Now, besides us beating to <coughs> death the fact that the medical application asks, do you currently use any medication? We've got another question to beat to death to make sure to maximize the likelihood that you'll be coming away from this webinar tonight with a ideally cl more clear understanding of what's being asked in the medical application. And there it is. Have you ever, I'm going to get to read it for once. Go ahead. <clears throat> have you ever in your life been diagnosed with, had, or do you presently have a certain medical condition? Uh, there are 26 of them in section 18 of the medical history part of the form. That's the next section you'll see on the medical application. Mm -hmm. And uh, that covers pretty much everything from head to toe. So uh, there's a few of the examples right there. There are, I believe, 26 is what I've counted in the past, including the the one about drugs and alcohol, uh, drug and alcohol convictions, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Mm -hmm. But um, because of the way Ferdy read the question, <laughs> have you ever had in your life? So there's no there's no disputing that. They're saying any time in your life in the past. So once you have a medical, if let's say you fell out of the tree at Grandma's house when you were nine years old, and you got you had a brief loss of consciousness. Mm -hmm. You now have a medical history of loss of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now it's you know it's an explained one, but it's still a reportable condition on the medical application because mm -hmm. of the way the question is worded. And uh, you know aviation lawyers for years, for decades, have been chastising the medical application because it's it it, it can be a complicated form because it's left to the discretion of the the applicant to figure out what what the FAA really means by by all their instructions and the questions themselves. But the key thing is, if it's ever happened to you, you're going to report it on the medical application. And going forward on every subsequent medical application, anything that you've checked yes to before is always going to be a yes, again, because of the way the question is worded. Right. Your response or the explanation for that will be previously reported. And then once the FAA has it in your record that, okay, you, you de declared this and you've declared it repetitively and there's been no change in your medical history, it's not going to be a problem. But it's still reportable. So, you know, what will attract their attention if it's a yes one time and then your next medical, it's a no, because they do quality control. They, yep. they will go back and review all these. And if they see a discrepancy, you're going to get a letter from the FAA saying, hmm, yeah, we see on your most recent application you check no, but in the past you've checked yes, so tell us what's going on there. Right, because what, what you're really doing by answering the question that way is, you're, is on the second application when you say no, you're saying, I have never in my life had a history of hay fever. Well, two years ago when you applied, yeah. you said you did, and you explained it to our satisfaction. Now you're telling us you don't. Right. What else aren't you telling us? Right, right. Uh, Remember, it's an investigation. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like to think about it from this model. When you talk about a medical application, that sounds like uh, almost a passive uh, act on the side of the FAA, the recipient of your application. Right. But when you talk about a medical application uh, triggering an investigation, God, that sounds damning. But yeah. it kind of makes it sound more like a, an active portion of what goes on with the FAA. Right. And that's, that's fair. Like you said, sure. QC quality control occurs. Right. We have members on occasion contact us who say, I applied for a medical and got it uh, a year ago with no problem. And then uh, I just p got a letter a year later, today now, uh, in the F from the FAA in the mail saying, oh, I need to provide more information about this. What in the world triggered that? And it's just a rolling quality control process. And you have swerved again into one of the points that we need to make. The the FAA is a very busy bureaucracy. They, they process thousands and thousands and thousands of applications every month. As a result of the government shutdown that happened in late 2017 and early, or sorry, 2018 and early 2019, they're still, on the day we're doing this webinar on March 27th, they're still digging out from the backlog yep. that, that built up as a result of the government furlough. So just because you get it issued a medical certificate by your AME, don't be surprised if six months down the road mm -hmm. you get this letter from the FAA saying we're reviewing your application from whatever date and have some questions we need more information on. You think, how did, why are they just now getting back to me? It's because they're just now getting to the application and realizing, oh, we need to ask some more questions. So right. uh, it, it's not an efficient bureaucracy. The, everybody knows it from the administrator of the FAA, the federal air surgeon, right on down to all of us that have to deal with this on a regular basis. It's been that way forever. I don't think it's ever really going to become get much more efficient. Uh, hopefully they will, but expect when, when you get deferred, 
expect a delay because there's, it's just inherent in the process and it's going to take you a while to get it all sorted out, which is why we emphasize so much, don't get deferred if you can possibly avoid it. Right. So Again, just, call us. Right. Just to be perfectly clear, <coughs> deferral is what occurs when you walk into your AME, your Aviation Medical Examiner's Office, and that's a doctor who has uh, obtained uh, the privilege from FAA to be able to issue medical certificates. It's not an FAA employee. It's, it could be your treating physician who may also happen to be an AME. If that AME, when you apply for, when you fill out your medical application and visit them for the exam, and we're going to talk about what's in the exam in a minute, uh, if the AME uh, it, it can issue you a medical certificate, they'll issue. Uh, if the AME knows based on the rules that you cannot obtain a medical certificate based on a small number of medical conditions or maybe medications, uh, they will deny you. Uh, there's a middle road, a third road, and that's what we keep talking about, and that's deferral. So deferral is when your local doctor, think of it as your local branch of the FAA, who's in, uh, performing the medical application, uh, between your medical history and, and what you present that day in the office determines that they're not quite comfortable uh, with issuing you a medical that day uh, or they, they have guidance in front of them that says they must defer in either case right. that local AME will take your application and say sorry I can't issue you but you're not denied we're going to defer and that sends your application on to Oklahoma City uh, to, uh, to uh, AMCD where uh, FAA will review your application uh, in more detail and then make a final determination. And that's when Gary, uh, where Gary has been making comments about you don't want to be deferred and that's because of the time constraint. Right now, uh, are we still running around 90 days like it has been for the uh, past It's actually years? a little worse than that right yeah. now. 90 days was ha prior to the furlough, okay. but we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing some cases that are in Washington, mm -hmm. some of these HIMS cases, the SSRI cases that have been out there for seven, eight, nine months or even longer. So mm -hmm. there's some, the more complex the medical history, mm -hmm. the longer it's going to take. That's just the way to look at it. But right. uh, routine, a routine deferral where the FAA just asks for some additional information right. and you get that information to them and they finally clear it, you're probably looking at uh, 90 to 120 days. For example, if you were a diabetic and you didn't meet what they call the khaki or conditions in AME can issue criteria. Uh, if you're on one specific medication, metformin for diabetes and your A1C level is below 6.5, I believe, mm -hmm. an AME could issue you uh, a medical certificate in the office if, you're, if you have a diabetic diagnosis. However, if you're outside those criteria, you can still get a medical and we'll talk about how diabetes is an initially disqualifying condition, as we've said, but you would get deferred, but, but that would be a fairly simple deferral meaning right. that you've you've met the criteria for a special issu issuance but the application does have to get reviewed in Oklahoma City no matter what. Yeah. Uh, again, you swerved into things. Let's touch on the underlying philosophy. The the regulations are what they are, but there's a policy and a procedure in place that the FAA has established over decades for certain medical conditions and there's the online guide for aviation medical examiners. It's primarily for AMEs to reference, but it's available to anybody because it's online, so anybody can go out and take a look at it. Provides that information to the AME and on those circumstances that in which the AME can issue, but some of those are just, you have to defer it. The AME doesn't have any choice there. So uh, we're not going to get into deep in the FAA certification philosophy and their policy, but policies are created by the FAA based on the existing regulations and then they create these policies that say, okay, if you have this condition, this is what we need to see in order to be able to certify and you've got to meet certain criteria. So for diabetics, uh, they, they like to see a good control of your A1C hemoglobin, mm -hmm. which uh, in this case is pretty high just since you brought it up, Ferdy, 8.9%, which is a really high A1C hemoglobin, but right. for certification purposes, an AME, uh, the FAA could certify someone on diabetic medications with an A1C that high. Now their treating doctor is probably not going to be very happy with their with their compliance and control if their A1C is, is still that high on medications. But that 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 plays to the difference in how clinical medicine works and mm -hmm. how regulatory medicine works. And maybe we'll talk 
hear at the end a little bit more about that, but mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the things that creates a lot of angst for pilots because their doctors, on one hand, their treating physicians are telling them, you'll fly, you're, you're good to go, I'd go flying with you with your condition, and yet the FAA either doesn't issue them a certificate or requires them to jump through a lot of hoops to get a special issuance in order to qualify. So that's one of the kind of the pitfalls and one of the, uh, the realities of dealing with the FAA, particularly for special issuances. <coughs> The difficulty here is we've got so many things we want to tell you, uh, and we just one more thing, one more thing. It's like Columbo, one more question. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but let's get back on the road. Right. Um, everything we've said is good, but we'll we'll return now back to the application process where we're talking about medical history. There he is, right there. And yeah. and and frankly, uh, the two two prior slides that we already saw, we don't need to see them again, uh, cause less consternation. Where you're saying whether or not you had, uh, you know. Um, asthma, whether or not you had diabetes. This section, on the other hand, triggers a lot of contacts. You know, we, we help our e members with, through phone calls, email, chat, and uh, this section that relates to FAR 6115 in, indirectly uh, causes a lot of angst because if you are not sure what the answer for these questions, you're probably going to have to answer in a way that you don't like, and that's because the questions are actually rather difficult to understand the breadth of, right? Right, right. Yeah, this is one of the most complicated items in Section 18 on the application because it's it's a multi-part, it's a multi-part question if you want to look at it as a question because it's asking if you've had a history of any arrests and or convictions involving driving while intoxicated by, while impaired by, or while under the influence of alcohol or a drug, or history of an arrest, conviction, or administrative actions involving offenses which result in denial, suspension, uh, cancellation, or revocation of your driving privileges, or which resulted in attendance in an educational or rehabilitation program. Sorry, I, did, I didn't intend to read the whole thing, but you see, it's a complicated question they're with like all those ors in there. There's a yeah, there, there's no wiggle room. I think there are like a dozen things in there. Yeah, that's yeah, it's uh, it gets pretty complicated. So you got to read that question really carefully. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we deal with this a lot. We get a lot of calls from from members who have had DUIs. It's bad enough if you're not a pilot to get a DUI because mm -hmm. uh, all a, you, you go through all these, the court issues, and the, I'm not speaking from personal experience, but <laughs> I'm only from people that we've talked to. Uh, the court costs, dealing with the lawyers, dealing with the courts, and your license is suspended, and now you got a, an interlock that you have to do. I mean, it's just a big mess for everybody with the DUI, but if you're a pilot, and you have to report this on a medical application, that, that just compounds your, your issues, you know, manifold compound, mm -hmm. because now the FAA is involved and now they want to know everything about your alcohol use habits, uh, because one of the disqualifying medical histories is a history of substance dependence. Mm -hmm. So even though you may have only had one DUI, that's one too many, so, and it depends on your blood alcohol level too. So there are a number of things the FAA is immediately going to ask for when, when you report a DUI on the application. They're going to want to see a copy of the police report. They want to see the court records. They want to see the report of the blood alcohol level. Mm -hmm. If for heaven forbid you refused a breathalyzer test, mm -hmm. that even makes it more complicated because now you're you're giving the FAA a huge suspicion that because you chose not to test, you probably you know, were under the influence. Mm -hmm. And now since the FAA doesn't know what the blood alcohol level was, they're going to hold you to a higher standard to prove that you don't have a, a substance abuse or dependence problem. So it really gets it gets real complicated in a big hurry. Um, not only do the medical group deal with the DUIs, but we send a lot of those cases over to our um, attorneys on our legal services plan under our pilot protection services. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll want to talk about PPS, so remind me of that later Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Uh, so DUIs <coughs> are just a huge deal. Uh, one is bad enough, but if you have a second DUI any time in your driving history, that just really raises the stakes and it, it becomes a, a really expensive, complicated ordeal to get your medical back after a DUI. So just don't drink and drive. That's just the, the, the simplest way to do it. So yep. uh, let's not belabor that anymore, but it gets, it's really complicated, so don't do it. And there's another question in that section as well. Uh, I'm sorry, to go back to, uh, Medical History 3, we've got a non-traffic convictions question as well. Yeah, non-traffic convictions is anything else. So if you had a, you know, a felony conviction for possession of a firearm or a bank robbery or uh, 
transporting drugs by airplane. That's a really <laughs> that's oh. a really bad one. That's not a double whammy. That's a ten. <laughs> yeah, that's a ten x whammy for yeah. sure. So that's really bad. But the FAA wants to know about those too because if a, if somebody has a personality that that prompts them to do things illegal. Like maybe I've had 10 restraining orders placed against me, for example, right? Uh, for, in contrast, you know, one of the questions I handled when I started on the phones here was uh, a gentleman who had four felony convictions for real estate fraud. And he wanted to know, does that apply? And how you do think, I answer how that How does question? that affect my medical certificate? Right, yeah, right. Yeah, well, exactly. you know, I, I don't work for the FAA, but I would have to suspect that that would be far lower on the spectrum of things that are interesting from an aeromedical perspective, then 10 restraining orders, does this person have a personality disorder? Exactly, Right. exactly. So yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. Somebody that's been involved in real estate fraud probably would not get the level of scrutiny that somebody that had you know 10 restraining orders because they were beating up their girlfriend or whatever. There you go. Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a huge deal. But the FAA doesn't assume anything. So even if you report a non-traffic conviction, you still have to provide an explanation, and right. if it's a yeah, you know, it's a reasonable explanation. Yeah, I got shot. I got caught shoplifting when I was ten years old. Okay, yeah. and you're thirty five years old right. now. Okay, the FA is probably not going to be too concerned about that. <laughs> but the underlying the issue, the point <laughs> is that the FA is always suspicious about the potential for underlying psychiatric or, or psychological conditions that could affect your qualifications to hold a medical certificate. So right. that's why the question's there, and that's why they, they look at it and take it seriously if you if you report something on the application relative to that. Uh, right while we're on that topic, I'm sorry, uh, one more hit on that one. Uh, CJ wants to know, what if the DUI was 29 years ago? Uh, that's good. Uh, typically, uh, the FAA is gonna pay less attention to a, a single DUI the further back it was in your driving history. Now, they still may ask you for a copy of your driving records, and if <coughs> mm -hmm. they find anything else in the course of that investigation, mm -hmm. then you know they, it could create a, a, a additional problems. But a DUI that long ago is probably not going to get get too much uh, get too much attention on the part of the FAA. In fact, the AME could issue a medical certificate to you in the office. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the guideline says if you if the last DUI was more than five years ago and there's nothing else showing up, the AME can issue the medical certificate in the office, but you still may get a letter from the FAA sometime later saying, hey, you know, tell us a little bit more about what's going on here. Gotcha. Okay, let's finally go to the Andy, Andy Sable slide, give a yes. quick, uh, quick uh, shout out to one of our former aviation tech specialists here. Uh, and let's, let's talk about their relationship. <laughs> this is kind of a summary, uh, yep. kind of a summary slide because um, we talked about it earlier. It's not just the medication or just the medical condition. It's 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 both. It's it, both sides of this of this coin that we were talking about earlier. So, the the medical history item 18 that we were just talking about and item 17 the medications history kind of form this 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 uh, composite Compendium. picture of yeah. what's going on on the on the medical history. And again, you, you you understand a little bit more about why they call it an investigation because they're kind of putting all the pieces together. And this, this is something the AME would be doing at the time of the exam and then subsequently by the FAA, just to make sure there's nothing that looks a little, a little out of whack. Because um, you know, the fact of the matter is, pilots lie on their medicals and sometimes they you know, try to avoid telling the FAA things that they probably should have. And so there's a, mm. it's not an element of distrust, but this is what the FAA's, this is their job. So um, just keep that in mind and they're not out there to, to, to get us, they're just out there to keep the airspace safe. All right, so we've talked about indicating our medication history, we, uh, uh, current <coughs> medication use rather. We've talked about indicating our medical history as far as conditions. Now finally, we also have to let the FAA know about recent doctor visits. Right, right, this is item 19. This is the third of the trifecta of things that you look for on the medical application. It's visits to health professionals <coughs> in the last three years. Now the, the, the first takeaway from that is if you're reporting your routine wellness exams, your annual physical exams with your primary care physician or your nurse practitioner or physician's assistant just for your routine office visits. That's not gonna attract a lot of attention. It's, the, it's when you start reporting specialty visits like to a cardiologist mm -hmm. or a neurologist. Oncologist. Oncologist for sure. Yep. Um, that's when they're gonna start asking more questions. And right. so again, this is kind of the third, third piece of the triangle. So they're gonna look at that medical history and medications usage. 
And uh, our rule of thumb is, like I said before, anytime you're reporting something on the form for the first time, maybe I didn't say this before, but I'll say it now. If you're reporting it for the first time on a medical application, the minimum you need to have for the AME to be able to more easily determine if he or she can issue a medical is have a letter from your doctor. It may just be a quick, a quick note based on an office visit that you were you know, prescribed, um, prescribed Ambien short term uh, because you were uh, flying and crossing multiple time zones for work mm -hmm. and you know just it was a, it was a jet lag issue mm -hmm. but uh, a, a minimum a minimum letter from your treating physician gives the AME a little bit more information to work with and in in many cases that can be the difference between getting issued in the office and ending up getting a deferral so mm -hmm. a little bit of information can go a long way so uh, <coughs> again it, it only goes back three years but the key there is if you're seeing, let's say you're being treated for, for cancer. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the oncologist maybe four times a year, every three months. So you've got all of those visits plus anybody else that you've seen in the, during the, that reporting time. You don't have to list every single visit. You can combine all of those visits to the same doctor for the same reason mm -hmm. and just report it one time. Just put the date of the most recent vis uh, visit and then just put multiple follow-up office visits, multiple routine office visits, ever how you want to word it. But as, uh, that way you don't have to, you don't have to keep track of every single visit. Because a lot of members, I mean, they're seeing 20, 25 different physicians, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, four or five different physicians, but you're seeing them all multiple times. Right. And there's just not enough room on the form to list all of those, and then you have to attach a separate sheet. So the FA gives us a little benefit of the doubt. So just report it one time, just say uh, multiple routine visits, and, and then obviously you'll need documentation for what those visits were all about. But uh, uh, you, can, you can deal with it that way. So those are the three things that we really, that, that we really focus on in, uh, and, and talking to members about the the application, so those are the those are the ones that really you know, this is where the meat of the application is. Exactly. Let's hit briefly on the NDR. Uh, so uh, when you complete your application, uh, you're giving the FAA an authorization to take a one-time look based on this application uh, at the National Driver Registry. And <clears throat> if you're thinking to yourself, well, Ferdy, you were talking about those questions about whether or not I have an arrest or conviction. Uh, regarding uh, you know driving while impaired, this is why you have to answer that truthfully. Besides the fact that you're completing a federal document and, and, and triggering a related investigation, FAA is going to cross-check and, and look in the National Register to see if you've not reported a DUI uh, under that that medical history question, and they look and find that you have one. It's not good. You don't want that to happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Again, that's you know, coming, being truthful on the application because uh, there are many ways in which the FAA can reach out to touch us, and mm -hmm. sometimes the, the touch is more like a slap. So uh, the NDR has been around since 1990, and that declaration statement's been on the on the application uh, since that came out. So again, the FAA is really focused and, and intent on alcohol-related motor, motor vehicle actions, which is kind of why Congress mandated the NDR become a part of the, the um, medical application process. Mm -hmm. So let's move on. 6153, this is a, one of the most important regulations, and we talk about it, uh, it, it, I've talked about it for years at every seminar I've done, at every, every fly-in and every uh, when we used to have expos and summits. 6153 is uh, basically it's a regulation that all of us operate under the, from the time our medical certificate is issued until we go back to the AME to renew that medical six months or two years or a year, whatever, how long it takes. And it's, it's the regulation just puts the burden on us to not exercise our privileges anytime we have a medical deficiency <coughs> that we feel makes, us ne makes it <coughs> necessary, unnecess necessary for the safe performance of the pilot operation that we're operating under. And 6153 is important uh, in, in the context of basic med too, and we'll, I guess we'll try to touch on basic med uh, like we promised at the beginning. But uh, we always throw this slide in here because I think it's one of the most important regulations because it's there to protect the FAA, but it's also there to protect us too and uh, give us a little bit of guidelines about basically we don't fly when we don't feel well mm -hmm. because we're medically self-assessing from the time that medical is, is, is issued to us by the AME and that was one of the, the premises under which we fought so hard to get basic med mm -hmm. legislation passed and now into effect is that pilots don't fly when they don't feel well and then we're not out there intentionally you know, trying to put the, put, the, put the airspace in danger. So we just like to 
re remind everybody that the regulation is there and it applies not only to medical conditions, but also to use of medication. So mm -hmm. again, th they're covering both sides of that coin again, like we like we talked about a couple of times. So uh, uh, just keep that one in mind. That's that's kind of the that's kind of the umbrella regulation that governs all of the the, the safety factors, particularly uh, in Part sixty Part sixty seven. All right, let's hit the list real briefly. We'll flip through the slides uh, showing what we call the mandatory, the 15 mandatory disqualifying conditions. Right. Uh, so these are conditions when presented to uh, your aviation medical examiner uh, will almost assuredly result in a denial or a deferral, more importantly, uh, meaning that uh, you may have pro to provide additional information or you may have to modify your course of treatment or action. There's right. nothing magic about these 15. They, these 15 conditions have been in the regulations probably as for as long as there have been medical standards, and that dates back in the U.S. to about late, late 1930s. These are the conditions that uh, are most likely, in the FAA's eyes, to cause impairment or incapacitation. So these are the ones that are disqualifying by regulation, but as Ferdy's mentioned, they are not permanently disqualifying. That just means that the AME cannot issue a medical certificate in the office and th those conditions have to be reviewed on an individual basis by the FAA and usually, it, well always, it requires a lot of documentation depending upon <coughs> what the diagnosis is and then if, it, if the FAA finds that those conditions don't pose an undue, uh, unacceptable risk for incapacitation, the pilot can be certified under a special issuance authorization which is a discretionary certificate part of part 67 67 401 if you want to look it up mm -hmm. that gives the federal air surgeon the discretion to make an allowance or a dispensation based on the medical history that the FAA has established and therefore determines that if you've met this criteria we think you're going to be safe to fly for the period of time that that special issuance is in effect which is usually one year so they're they're doing a fast forward and saying it's kind of like they have a crystal ball, but they've, they've, they've done risk assessment. They've looked at your their stress test if you've had heart disease with bypass surgery or stent placement. And they're saying, based on what we see here, we think you can safely exercise those privileges for the 12 months that that medical is going to be in effect. Mm -hmm. And next year at this time, we're going to ask you to do the same thing over again. And we're going to see if there's any changes uh, in your medical condition. And if not, then we'll grant you a certificate for another 12-month period. So the special issuance, when it's one of these conditions, is always going to be a special issuance. The FAA doesn't have any choice because it's codified mm -hmm. right into the uh, Part 67 uh, regulatory language. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about now what we've got a few more slides, and uh, we still have uh, a few questions queued up. Okay, we've got three good ones in there that uh, we'll, we'll hit in just a few minutes when we get to the Great. end. Great. Okay. So I finished my application. Uh, I'm ready to go to the doc. I make my appointment. I show up. What should I expect that day? When you print out the uh, MedExpress application, you will have a confirmation number at the bottom of that page, and you will take that number with you to the medical examiner's office and the first thing they're going to do when they when you walk through the doors they're going to say give me your confirmation number and they're going to pull up your exam out of the FAA system and then uh, the AME will have that information available the information that you provided on the front side of the form and then from there they'll go on through the examination an AME will probably want to look over your information and say oh, tell me a little bit more about why you checked yes to this item and uh, things like that and then the basic exam is exactly that. It's a basic examination. Just because you're on uh, um, uh, applying for an FAA medical doesn't change the, the scope of what a physician would be doing in the, in the way of, of, of the examination. Even though the FAA does specify in their training to AMEs, you know, these are the things that we expect you as an AME to examine mm -hmm. when, you, uh, when you show up for a flight physical at one of the three, three, three classes of medical. So uh, basic information is just going to be, they're going to check your eyes and, you'll, and, and they'll check your vision. Let's, uh, yeah, let's cut, cut to that uh, medical exam, what to expect slide. Uh, two back. Two back, there you yeah. go. Great. Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, listen to your heart pick up any arrhythmias, anything that's going on, sounds a little little funky. Uh, check your breathing, make sure you got good pulmonary function. Eyes, ears, and throat, you know, they'll, they'll look deep into your eyes, it's called the fundus, just to see if they see anything uh, anything problematic back in the, in the deep part of your eye. Mm -hmm. um, same thing, they'll check your ears. Uh, the vision check will be done in the, probably before you actually have the physical exam, 
and the hearing will also be done. The hearing just says <laughs> you have to have a the ability to hear a conversational voice at huh? six feet. That's huh? yeah, yeah, right. Pretty straight, much, pretty straightforward there. Yep. Check your blood pressure. Blood pressure is a common problem. As long as you're under good control, the FAA allows a blood pressure reading of up to 155 over 95, which is a pretty high blood pressure. Yep. But again, this is regulatory medicine versus clinical medicine. So uh, if you're if you're wandering around that 150 over 90 mark, you're probably going to be on medications anyway. Right. But uh, AMEs will occasionally pick up a pilot uh, applicant that really does have untreated un uh, um, untreated blood pressure and they'll put them on medication and once they're stabilized they can be issued. So any other medical conditions that show up on the application, any medications that are going to be a flag, most AMEs should know what medications are okay for FAA and which ones are not. Um, urine test, believe me I've had plenty of FAA flight physicals in my time and mm -hmm. many times the AME never asked for a urine specimen. I swear I didn't have one on my first go. Um, Everyone since but not the first go, which is with a, with a different AME. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so and, I'm not but crazy. It's, it's, it, no, no, but okay. it's part of the examination, but for whatever reason, I guess uh, some a AMEs don't bother to check and they just check off as normal. Well, so he's no longer practicing, so. Yeah, yeah, well, that's probably the same AME w that I was talking about, too. It's possible. He was a urologist, too, oddly <laughs> enough, so. <laughs> But uh, it's not, you know, it's it's not. A, there's nothing special about the flight physical. The FAA is going to be requiring the AME to do certain things. But really, if if it's a good AME flight physical exam, it's gonna, not going to be really any different from what you would get if you went in for your to your primary care physician for <laughs> an annual physical exam. So right. and they they should be accomplishing pretty much the same thing, even though it's two distinctly different purposes because the FAA physical exam is a screening exam to make sure you meet the minimum standards for the issuance of a medical certificate, whereas your primary care doctor is really going to be looking for right. things, okay, you know, is there something here we need to be paying close attention to? Yeah, R really what I wanted the takeaway to be is no big deal. Yeah. The exam is really no big deal. It's going to take longer for you to <clears throat> maybe bring that AME, that aviation medical examiner up to speed on your situation, especially if it's your first time visiting them and they have no prior records. It may take longer to explain who you are, what you do, and more importantly, your meds, your conditions, than to do the actual exam with the stethoscope and the eye machine and, and the looking in your, eye, your ears and things yeah, like that. Yeah, and that's a very no individual thing. I mean, there are like just under 3,000 AMEs in the country, and um, you know, even though the, they're prescribe things that the AME needs to do, <laughs> some, some physicians are going to be probably more thorough than, than others. I mm -hmm. mean, just, just the way it is. That's not the FAA's preferred way, but yeah, it is what it is. Well, so. sometimes experience lends, <coughs> lends them being more physician efficient as Correct. the years go on. That's exactly right. So let's talk briefly about how long you're at that medical certificate you've been issued. Congratulations. Let's talk about how long that medical certificate is good for. Right. Real quickly, nothing changes when you cross over or through the magic age of 40. Everything is predicated on how old were you when your medical certificate was issued. If it, you, you had your medical issued when, when you were less than 40 years old, it's good for 60 calendar months. If it's a third class. A third class, yes. Right. This example, third class medical. And if you're 40 or older at time of issuance, it's good for 24 calendar months. Calendar months is a way that you basically round out to the end of the month. So if you're over 40, you were issued on January 15th of 2000. That medical is good then until January 31st of 2002. So 24 months or two years later, rounding out to the end of the month. Okay? That's it. Okay, let's move on. Now what? We're approaching expiration. <clears throat> we've been issued, we've flown all through the, the almost the entire vol validity cycle of our existing medical certificate. Now I gotta do it again. Well, what are my choices? You can do the same thing over again, now that you're all familiar right. with it. Now, of course, if two years are in younger uh, pilot's cases, five years have gone by, you're, not you're gonna be a little rusty about what you filled out and maybe even how you did it. So contact us again, but you can always go through that, uh, that same third class medical process just like you did before. Or uh, you could move over to the new Part 68 medical uh, certification alternative known as Basic Med. And like Gary said, that's something we've been talking with our members about uh, day in, day out for a number of years now, trying to educate uh, new new users of basic med on how it can plug into their medical certification regime. Uh, we've got some links there. You can see where you can visit our website for more information, as well as where you can find the online course where uh, that which is required to take as part of that certification process. 
And again, please call us. It, it's been our experience over the last couple of years <laughs> that uh, there's a lot of opinions about basic med out there and uh, not all the information that's floating around out there is accurate as far as uh, the, the requirements and qualifications for basic med. So if you want to pursue that, we have everything on the on the website uh, on our basic med landing page but again give us a call we can explain the whole process to you if you decide you don't want to go the third class medical route again basic med is probably a really good option for you especially if you end up having to get a special issuance because right. once you've uh, <coughs> gotten that special issuance you would uh, be able to transition over to basic med and you won't have to be providing all the follow-up information to the FAA to maintain that third class special issuance Okay, uh, I've got a few questions here for okay. us. Let's go in, into the questions. Heather says, my son is 18 and interested in becoming a commercial pilot in, in time. That may be a factor. Mm -hmm. We thought get, getting, uh, she says level two med clearance, she's asking about a second class All medical right. certificate, would be a good idea, but unfortunately it has turned into chaos. Can he withdraw without a penalty? I'm not done. Uh, I ask because he is still in high school and the FAA is asking for additional testing which will require a two-hour drive to find a certified neuro AME and missing school and additional expense. So it sounds like she wants to, they want to get out from under that, that open investigation now. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not <coughs> going to happen because there's no, there's no vehicle once an application has been opened up by an aviation medical examiner, it's considered a live application at that point. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's no legal remedy for withdrawing an application once it's, once it's opened up and is alive. So you have to jump through the hoops. And it sounds like, it, I'm just speculating, but there may be an ADHD component. I'm not saying there is, mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. there could be when you say neuro, uh, neuropsychologist or neuro AME. Um, but once that application is pulled up via that confirmation number, the AME has two choices, well three, but two practical choices, either you're, you're, you're found to be eligible for the medical certificate and the AME can issue it in the office or it gets deferred and then you're going down the rabbit hole and playing with the FAA to provide them with the information that they've asked for. So that's actually a, a, a really good question that, uh, a, a, a point that you want to be careful what you're applying for because once that application is live, you don't have a choice. It's either comply with the FAA's request or if you don't provide them the information they're asking for, you're going to get denied a medical certificate and then that takes a lot of your options off the table until you're able to go back to the FAA and be found eligible for a medical certificate. Right, so it's not a necessarily a denial based on the fact that I've provided all the information and I'm still found ineligible. It could be a denial short of that for failure to provide is what Correct. we call it, right? Correct. It's an administrative, what I, we call it an administrative denial simply because the FAA never got the information that they needed to complete the investigation right. to determine if you're qualified for the medical certificate. And unfortunately, except in extremely, extremely rare cases, if the FAA is asking for something, you need to provide it or you'll get a denial for failure to provide. Correct. Uh, there's not much merit with complaining about, well, I don't see why they need that information. Well. They're the certifying body. If they <coughs> want something, they're allowed to ask for it. And if they ask for it, they either get it, or if they don't, you, you're, you're not going to walk away with a medical certificate. The regulators uh, almost always win. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, Chris Tefer wants to know, I had LASIK. When I did, I chose to have monovision. Uh, the AME would not pass me. They said they would email the FAA. It's been about three <laughs> weeks now, and I haven't, uh, heard, I've, haven't heard anything. What should I do? OK. Two, two issues there. First of all, there's nothing wrong with having LASIK, but because you had a monovision correction, that is you have one eye that corrects for distance yep. and the other eye that corrects for near vision, you don't meet the vision standards because the standards for all three classes of medical say that you have to correct to for third class 2040 in each, each eye, eye separately. separately for distance and for near vision as well. So what you're going to have to do is the easy way to do it unfortunately, is get corrective lenses, one lens that corrects your, your distance eye for near vision, and the other lens that corrects your near eye for distance, so that you can see 2040 for distance and near vision in each eye separately. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you gotta go through a waiver process that will require probably a medical flight test. Mm -hmm. That'll be authorized by the FAA, and then you gotta schedule that through the Flight Standards District Office. It's a, it's a total pain, it's time consuming, 
um, it's just easier to get corrective lenses. That way you can wear those in. The AME will be able to, uh, well, in this case, since you've already had your physical, you'd uh, provide uh, an updated eye evaluation once you've had corrective lenses that show that you meet the standards in each eye separately. Then the FAA would probably issue the certificate with a limitation that says must wear corrective lenses mm -hmm. while exercising <laughs> your privileges. Right. Uh, that's a good question. Okay. And then finally, uh, from the question bucket, Wesley wants to know, I had an AFib, atrial fibrillation incident 10 months ago. It has been controlled with no further incidents. Corrected with cardioversion and since controlled with medicine. Uh, now, I'm a little unclear here. He says, I have applied for a third class medical. What should I expect from the FAA? Maybe he's saying he's a, may, filled out his application but hasn't had his exam. Uh, possibly. Okay. But uh, either way, it's going to be a special issuance because you had atrial fibrillation that's been treated, even though that's not one of the specific disqualifying conditions, it is one that the FAA does under special issuance. So mm -hmm. as long as you've, uh, your AFib is well controlled, cardioversion works for some people, but cardioversion is usually done as an initial treatment for AFib, mm -hmm. and it'll, it'll kick you back, kick your heart back into a normal rhythm, but it doesn't always stay in rhythm. Right. So you may ultimately either have another cardioversion or you may want to consider talking to your cardiologist about having an ablation procedure, which is a radio frequency ablation that um, actually knocks out the, the aberrant conduction pathway that's causing the atrial fibrillation in the first place. Mm -hmm. Either way, it's going to be a special issuance. So the FAA is going to follow you annually, probably with a what's called a, a Holter monitor. It's a 24-hour ambulatory heart monitor and a status report because you probably are going to be on may be on uh, anticoagulant medications yep. just in case you kick back into atrial fibrillation. You don't want to have a clot form in your atrium that goes into places where it can cause a lot of damage. So, but because AFib is a, it's a really common arrhythmia, but it has the potential to be problematic. So it's going to be a special issuance. Right. But if you haven't applied yet, uh, or if you have applied, you'll probably be getting a letter from the FAA asking for more information. Right. All right, before we wrap up, I've got a quick show note to switch to here. Uh, it's uh, with a bittersweet heart that uh, I want to mention that uh, our, uh, our ultimately our webinar series producer, Kathy Domzilla King, is retiring. She's sitting right over here. Uh, she'll be... <laughs> 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 I was wondering if we were going we to pull a fast one on her. Way to go, Paul. Kathy's retiring after 30 years here with AOPA. Um, She's uh, worked in a variety of areas. She's, uh, she's worked along with the seaplane pilots, the Air Safety Foundation, here in our Pilot Information Center. Uh, she writes a number of articles every month, both for print and online. Uh, I've worked closely with her since I started in 2011, helping to develop and maintain our, uh, our Pilot Information Center subject, air subject reports. So if you visit our website for things like international travel, our medical pages, uh, along with Gary, uh, Kathy's been responsible for all that. Uh, she's also, in the, in the past few years, I think we've done around seven webinars uh, uh, two years ago, last year, and then we're planning on it this year, but uh, uh, she'll be uh, leaving us next week. Uh, she's retiring, and she's going to be spending more time uh, with her wonderful husband in Alaska, and uh, we wish her well. It's going to be... Uh, it's going to be tough to pick up the pieces and move on. She's been a great asset, and she's uh, provided a great service to, to our department and to our members. So, so thank you for everything you've done, Kathy. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Ditto. We're going to miss you. All right, Gary. Well, thanks for your time today. It's it was fun. It's always it was, good it to fun. chew the bull on, uh, on med aeromedical because I think it's a good thing. How about the fact that we get paid to sit around and do this? Yeah, for sure. In, in fact, I was talking to another AOPA staffer today about that very thing, about how blessed we are to be able to work for an organization that serves all of you uh, AOPA members and pilots. And uh, it's a great organization. And uh, I know Kathy, uh, this being her last webinar and her last week here, probably uh, is, is feeling you know, something of, of a loss, too, because we are family here. Yep. And uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty, nice, pretty closely knit group. And, uh, but we love doing this stuff. It's uh, um, this is what we this is what our passion is. It's you know, it, it, especially in medical certification. It's kind of a it's it's an area that not everybody understands, and and so you know we're blessed to have the knowledge that we have about how the how the system works, and yeah, this is what we do is helping helping pilots fly. And not only here, but at Sun and Fun in Oshkosh as well. Sun and Fun is just coming up, so I had yep. to mention that. Uh, I won't be there. I don't think you're going this year. But, I am uh, not. But we're sending a few of our medical uh, certification specialists down there, along with our aviation technical specialists, 
so they can do the same things that they do here on the phone and uh, through email and chat in person. So if, you, uh, if you're going to be in Lakeland, uh, stop by the show and stop by our tent. Uh, so thanks for joining us and thanks for being here, Gary. If you have any other aviation related questions, uh, you can contact our team at 800-USA-AOPA. There's our contact information on the screen. Uh, we've got email, chat, and, uh, and phone. Uh, chat's getting big. In fact, it won't be long before it seems like we'll be receiving more chats than emails, believe it or not. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this, uh, this YouTube channel for more content. And also, please check out our podcast from the Pilot Information Center as well as other areas of AOPA uh, with their podcast offerings in the AOPA mobile app. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next time.